Hi, welcome back to the shop. My name's Dave. This is the Steam Powered Machine Shop. Uh, episode number 14. And uh, I just appreciate you uh, watching and commenting and subscribing. And uh, we've been pretty busy here in the last couple of weeks uh, doing quite a little bit of work on the uh, project engine. Uh, mostly on the crankshaft. I really didn't expect it to take as much time as it did, but um, so I videoed it as I went along with it, and uh, so it's kind of cut up into little operations to show you how it went along the way. And uh, there's some in this video about a job that came in the shop, uh, a paying job. We actually are a revenue generating machine shop and probably the only revenue generating steam powered machine shop in North America and uh, so these little jobs come in and we just do them um, so that's on there uh, what else happened we went uh, I went to uh, the rough and tumble steam engine show in Kinzer Pennsylvania since the last video and had a tremendous time there. They had 108 steam traction engines there. It's gotten to be the biggest coat, one of the biggest shows uh, in the United States and probably the biggest on the East Coast. Um, weather was great, had a good time, met a lot of uh, viewers there and had a chance to talk to them and bought a few flea market items and uh, was a good time all the way around. So I don't want to waste a lot of time chit-chatting here. Uh, if you do check my G Plus page, uh, my Google page, it's the little orange circle on the channel header. Uh, usually once a week or so I'll put up a couple of photos uh, of how things are going along in the shop. Um, if you care to look there and please leave a comment if it's something you're interested in uh, got a new machine here uh, just dragged it in here and, and washed it off haven't really even inspected it real close but I think it's in pretty nice shape it's a Racine 14 inch power hacksaw uh, probably 1920s vintage and uh, that would replace my little electric powered uh, peerless and go on the line shaft at some later date when we get time. Uh, so without further ado we'll get right to it. Thanks again. I wanted to show you this job before I got too far into it. Uh, this is one of those jobs that just sort of pay the freight around here. And it came in uh, about a month ago, and uh, it's a big cast iron cylinder with a 10 inch bore, uh, and it's a rotary vane vacuum pump. And uh, what it is, is on a sludge pump, they don't pump the sludge through the pump, they evacuate the tank. And that's what this thing is. And I don't know how big of a motor they had on it, have on it, or you know how much vacuum it pulls, but it's it's pretty big. It's it's about 20 inches long, and it's got a 10 inch bore. And inside, it's really grooved up. The veins are some kind of phenolic material. It has a cylinder that goes in here with long slots in it, and these veins are fit in the slots, and they're spring loaded, and they spring out against the outside of this bore and it's offset so that the veins go in and out and it, it you know works like an oil pump and uh, except backwards <clears throat> reminds me of an old smog pump from the 70s like they used to have on the cars that would pump air into the exhaust system but anyway he couldn't find anybody that could bore a 10 inch cylinder and all he wanted was it to be cleaned up and the big grooves taken out of it and smooth and straight. The diameter isn't really critical. Just take as little as possible out. So uh, I had this big bar for the horizontal boring mill 
with a head on it that I used uh, to bore uh, a six inch cylinder a while back. So I made this plate, uh, as you saw in the previous videos, this cast iron plate with a slot in it to hold the cutting tool and it's bolted to it to extend the diameter out and theoretically I can make even bigger plates to bore even bigger holes. So I've got it in the machine. Uh, this machine is not run under steam power. Uh, we figure it's a late 1930s machine. Uh, uh, Giddings and Lewis two and a half inch boring mill. Uh, it's probably the smallest boring mill that was ever made. Um, and I considered myself lucky to come by it. But uh, anyway, uh, I got an indicator on it and I had an indicator on the other end and I've got it indicated in plus or minus a couple of thousandths end to end and up and down and sideways so uh, I'm gonna put the cutting tool in it and take a trial pass through there and see how it looks Touching off all the way around. I set the tool out ten more thousandths and we'll see how it goes.
Okay, this order of business is to kind of evaluate the crankshaft on the <clears throat> Morris machine engine. And uh, we know it's bent, and I wanted to see where it was bent. And I've got this end indicated up in the fore jaw pretty close on the good part of the crank here. And as you can see, the other side has got a lot of run out in it. And I'm pretty sure that the bend is all right here where this stub is neck down. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to put this end in a steady rest and not have to deal with the, uh, uh, the center hole here and see what the rest of the crank looks like, how it mics out here and how it mics out here. I'm pretty sure this crank is fine, it's just that this end is bent. And the problem is this end is, this was a specially cut down crank for that gear. This is too small in diameter and the end of the bearing comes right here so this is all you got to put a pulley or something on it so I'm going to cut this off and drill back up in here uh, for about a half inch with a half inch diameter hole and I'm going to make a new crank stub that's probably going to be about oh, maybe 8 or 10 inches long and key it eventually I'm not going to key it until I get it done I'm going to make it about a 64th of an inch bigger in diameter than this is 2 inch nominal here. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so that when I weld it up, uh, if it warps a little bit, I'll be able to chew it up all the way out to the end at 2 inches. And then uh, I'll put a center hole in it out here and cut the keyway. Uh, these, these bearings are fair in fair shape. This one over here has got quite a little bit of wear on it. It's got quite a groove up in here. Oh, probably maybe 10 or 15 thousandths. So I think the plan is to turn these down, make them the same. It'll probably be about maybe 20, 30 thousandths under 2 inch. And then uh, uh, re-pour the bearings in the frame. So that'll take care of the main bearings. The rod bearing here looks like it's got some wear on it and some damage and some rust and everything. I, I think I'm going to farm this out to my crank grinder friend who does the work for my shop, my engine shop, uh, because it would be very time consuming. I'd have to make a, a special fixture to offset the crank in a faceplate and build a fixture like it out here on this end. And it's in order to get the crank to spin and have this be centered. Uh, so it's very easy to do it in a regular crank grinding machine because it's, it's got special chucks that offset it, whatever the stroke is. And I'm going to have him grind this one journal. And uh, you can see how the one counterweight's been taken off here. I have the other counterweight. Uh, they're bolted on. Of course, this thing only runs 250 RPMs, but evidently at some time they had trouble with them loosening up, so they kind of dammed them up here and poured them full of Babbitt. Uh, at first I thought that was to add more weight to it, but I think really it's to lock the bolts in place. Um, why this was taken off, I don't know. Sometime during the disassembly, somebody decided it should be taken off, so they did, but I have the other one and it'll go back on. It should be fine. And when we get all done with this and we get the uh, rod made and the piston made and the rings made and everything made, we're going to see how this balances out. Uh, back, it, it's going to be very interesting to see how in balance it actually is. Uh, back in those days, I don't know that they tried to balance them much at all, really. Uh, but there's a formula for doing that and uh, uh, it'll be interesting to try to balance it. Too late to change your mind now. Because uh, I wanted to set up the steady rest. Um, so I took a piece of stock which was 2 inch diameter which is the same diameter as the crankshaft main bearing and uh, indicated it up in here and then uh, uh, drill this, indicated on this end, drill the center hole, put the uh, 
uh, tailstock in the center hole and then just run the steady rest down until it just touches. So that sets my uh, steady rest up to that, that diameter. Okay. plan here is to bore and ream a half inch hole, a half inch deep, to kind of pilot the extension on the end of the crank that we're going to weld down there. So I've got my hook pool here. I'm going to go up to four on the roof. This is a 64 Thunder 5.8. Okay, this is the piece that I bought this morning for the crankshaft extension. Uh, it's two and three sixteenths. Here's the extension 
is driven in tight and ready to weld it up. Okay, I'm preheating this with the torch a little bit because it's always a good idea. You're not sure about the model that you're welding. That's about 400 degrees. I've been heating it for a little while. Okay, there it's welded. Now we're gonna heat it back up again and hold it at just barely red for a while to stress relieve it. As long as we got it hot, I'm going to try to melt that babbit out of it.
It is a square head bolt of questionable integrity. All right, this is back in the lathe. You can see how much this is warped when I welded it, but this diameter, of course, is quite a bit bigger than I need, so I think it'll come out. I'm just gonna face this off, put a center hole in it. If I can get the steady rest out of the way.
PTO end is roughed out to about two inches. We're going to take it down to inch and seven eighths, 1.875. Uh, this, where the bearing starts here, is going to have to be cut down a little bit further to clean up this bearing. But for the time being, I'm, uh, I'm playing around with my uh, center here uh, to make sure that I don't get a taper. And I had about a two and a half thousand taper. Uh, it was uh, heavy on this end, or light on this end. So uh, I moved the center that way about a thousand and a half. Check a taper. One nine eighty five. One nine eighty six and a half. So we're a thousandth and a half light on this end. So the center needs to go that way, eh, almost a thousandth. It's pretty close, but I think we can get it closer. Okay, I've got the dial indicator set up here. About zero, so let's see. We got to turn this thing clockwise to move that way. Oh, wait. Actually, what happens is it starts to turn the wrong way first. shaking a little bit, so I uh, put a couple bolts, T-bolts in here and a couple washers in there. Man, it really makes quite a difference. 